sort elements into groups. So I'm going to come around and check your homework here in about 15 minutes. We're going to go over the quiz questions from the last test, and then I'll um, come around and check the homework. This is one of the homework questions. So what did they use to... Yeah, it's this sheet right here. This is the other side of that sheet? Yeah, there's two sides. The... So I'm going to give you a little time to work on it in class because we did have an advisory today. So can anybody answer question number three on your homework? What did chemists use to sort elements into groups? Tyler? Is it properties? Uh, properties, yes, Scholar, very good. You've got like density, uh, boiling point, uh, solid liquid gas. Excellent. So what we're going to do now, we're going to... Okay, so number 20 is B. Very right, good, pick somebody. Oh, Maze. Uh, 21 is actually B, that's a typo. So 21 is B, the book was incorrect on that. All right, I did curve it, so you should be okay on that. I'll give you that point, Maze. Pick some my Maze. Good job. Pick some my. That is correct. Good job, Melanie. Uh, that would be C. C is correct there. Remember the last uh, electron configuration, the 4P4? Unless it's a transition metal, defines the element. All right, just pick some on it, Alex. Five is B. Tomorrow, we're going to be examining the formation of a compound. So chapter 7, which we're getting ready to go into, uh, examines naming specifically compounds. So there are two different types of compounds. You have ionic compounds and you have covalent compounds. Now if you have water, water is considered to be a molecule because it has more than one atom. Now, if you have, like, let's say, gold, let's say an, uh, one atom of gold, it's one atom. If you have a, a group of gold, it's still going to be considered atoms of gold because gold can bond in a lot of different ratios. You can have, like, 26 gold atoms or three gold atoms, whereas oxygen doesn't do that. It's typically O2. So you wouldn't say an atom of oxygen because it doesn't typically exist. It's usually a molecule of oxygen. O2. So molecule is a term we usually associate with nonmetals. I'm going to write that down. Molecule is usually a term we associate with nonmetals. So when you hear molecule, you're going to be thinking, okay, you're probably talking about a nonmetal. Um, so water is considered to be a molecule. Uh, CO2 is a molecule. In the lab you're going to do tomorrow, we're going to be burning magnesium. Now the question is, Will the ash weigh more than the metal? Yes. Raise your hand if you say yes, the ash will weigh more than the metal. It should weigh the same. Though. Daniel is correct. The ash will weigh more than the metal. Now, some of you might... Okay, sorry, Ethan. Um, some of you might not have good lab technique in that you take the crucible tongs and you put it into the crucible and you get ash on the tongs and you take it out and put it on the table. Now you have the ash on the table and it's not going to be in your measurement. That will affect your results. 
So if you're good tomorrow and you follow the procedure and keep the ash in the crucible, then you'll, you should see the ash weighs more than the metal. Now why is that? Because it's pulling oxygen out of the air. It's pulling oxygen out of the air, very good cruise. So the oxygen is going to bond with the magnesium. You get MgO, right? So what is the ash considered to be? It's considered to be an ionic compound. Write that down. You're making an ionic <coughs> compound tomorrow. MgO. Now most ionic compounds are considered to be what? Most ionic compounds are considered to be what? They're considered to be salts. So write that down. Yesterday we talked about uh, sodium being a cation and chlorine being an anion. And when you bring them together, you have an ionic compound. So if you see ions coming together, typically you're going to be making a salt. Ionic compounds are typically salts. Now this is going to be a, a powdery salt. Um, could you turn it into a rock salt? Possibly, um, if you dissolve it in water and then let it crystallize, you possibly could. You can make table salt into like a dust powder. <laughs> if you grind it up enough, it can be like a powder. So the powder, you're basically going to have a powder tomorrow of magnesium uh, oxide. <laughs> now, typically your salts are not oxides. They're, they're usually chlorides. That's what we associate salts with. Uh, and most of the um, uh, salts in the ocean are chloride-based because chlorine is such a large uh, percentage of the salt water. Um, how do we know that there's a larger percent of chlorine in the salt water compared to oxygen in the ocean? How do we know that there's a larger percent of chlorine in the water compared to oxygen in the ocean? Because oxygen dissolves in water. You have H2O, which is water, then you have things that dissolve into it like oxygen can dissolve in water, or the fish would what? Oh, die. The fish would die. Fish have to breathe oxygen in the water. They're not separating water to get the oxygen. They're breathing the oxygen in the water. So if you've been following the crisis in the Gulf, what's the crisis? Like the, eight the, eight years. the red tide? Yeah, it's killing like... It's killing like, like the... Like Killing the fish. What else is it killing? It's killing things about the fish. The turtles. The uh, sea turtles are kill being killed. And yeah, very much so. The red tide is causing a lot of problems. It's taking the oxygen. When does it take the oxygen out of the water? Yeah, at nighttime. So during the daytime, it's actually making oxygen into the water. But at nighttime, it has to respire. And that's when it pulls all the oxygen out of the water. So you wake up in the morning, you see all the dead fish floating around. That's what really the problem is. So tomorrow you're going to do this lab. You're going to make the salt magnesium oxide. And there are other type of compound that we're going to see in Chapter 7. Yes, CO2 does it all in water. You can get like carbonic, carbonic beverages. Carbonic acid is typically what's <coughs> so the shells of the animals. Now the other type of compound is the covalent compound, that's water. So water is a covalent compound. It's made of nonmetals only. So if you see only nonmetals, you're going to see a covalent compound. If you see metals and nonmetals, you're going to see an ionic compound. So the covalent compounds tend to share electrons, whereas ionic compounds tend to transfer. Who's transferring? Metal or the non-metal? Raise your hand. No, the metal. Remember that metals are kind of like men and they transfer their energy to the non-metal. It's kind of what they teach in health class. So all we're trying to use is some analogies like to help you better remember what you're doing. Like when I was at U of L, one of the things that my biology teacher always talked about was like the cell, he would com compare to things that in life, like there's a UPS truck that delivers things, and he would say that that is a particular part of the cell's function in an analogy. Like you have a cell wall in a plant, that would be like the border, and then you have a nucleus that would be like the federal government. 
So there, he would have analogies to help remember different parts of the cell. And that's all really I've done here is just trying to give you some analogies to help you remember things. That metals tend to uh, have some behavior similar to men. Uh, metals tend to do what with their electrons when they bond with other metals? They tend to trade them. So if you've ever seen like Pawn Stars, you go and you ever watch that movie or that TV show, Pawn Stars, most of the people that go in there are men. Now there are some women that go in there, the majority of the owners are men. Uh, trading is, I guess you'd say, risky. You might not get the best deal. They usually have experts come in to make sure they're not being taken advantage of, and they have been taken advantage of before. They bought something that somebody said was real and it was a, was a fake. So trades are risky. So metals trade electrons. When you see like a gold ring, 10 carat, it is trading electrons with the other elements in the ring. Also gold <laughs> trades with itself. So the other metals you mix in there can affect the alloy's strength. So what do nonmetals do? How, how do they uh, trade their electrons? How do they use, they don't trade their electrons, but what do they do with their electrons? They share. So nonmetals tend to share their electrons. Now, when my wife and I first got married, she would share clothes with her sister. She passed away, so I said was. So she would share clothes with her sister. Her sister would come over. Now, when we first got married, we had some kids, so my wife wasn't working, so I was the breadwinner, and I would go out and pay for her clothes, and then she's sharing it with her sister. I'm thinking, well, shouldn't we trade those, All right, so we get some money? That's what guys think, you know, okay, let's, let's trade so I have something. That share is, like, out there. You don't know whether you're going to get anything back. So she's sharing. Now, I didn't try to change her. I was like, I understand that you're wired to share, and if I try to change her into something she's not, she's going to get upset. So I couldn't just say, no, you can't share those clothes. I was like, yeah, it's fine. Go ahead and share those clothes with your sister. I'm going to get an argument over that. So that's kind of an example of sharing. Now, it's true with tasks as well. Like, I mow the lawn. That's a task. I say, I do this. That's a trade. You do the laundry. So I do one task, mow the lawn. She does the laundry. That's a trade. Does everybody see how that's a trade? Now, for many years, she would stack the laundry right by the, my closet door. And then after about six months, or more than several years, like I said, she said, doesn't that bother you? And I said, no, not really. It really was bothering me a lot. I just didn't want to, you know. It, I didn't want to share in the activity, because then if I'm sharing, then there's not a complete trade. That's how the metal thinks. So I'm just trying to maintain my metalness. Right? My metalness. I have to protect my metalness. Right, so I'm going to do this task, and you're going to do that. Now, we did compromise on some things. We, we do, like, I do some parts of cooking, and she does some parts of the others. So there is some sharing and some trading happening. That's called a compromise. But on certain things, you know, I have to maintain my metalness. Otherwise, I'll be sharing in everything, and then I'm overwhelmed. So it's important for me to remember the word no. Yeah, so keep that in mind. Kinetic energy formula, potential energy formula that uh, Madison wrote on the board. She wanted me to video. She's like, don't ever erase that. I said, well, I have to. So I'm going to erase it. But it's on video. Education. Okay, so the purpose is to determine the formula of magnesium oxide. So we're going to take some magnesium and we're going to react it with some oxygen. So who's going to read background for us? Pick somebody, I mean. Good job, Will. Ionic compound. Somebody help me out. What is an ionic compound? Close. No. Summer? Uh, no, that would be a covalent compound. Covalent nonmetal share. What is an ionic compound? Okay, close. Lily, what is an ionic compound? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, so yesterday we talked about it a little bit. It is a compound composed of ions. <laughs> ionic compound. So, Lily, you have two types of ions. What are the two types of ions? Shh. 
Lily? Uh, I didn't hear you say Lily. Summer? Right, they're up here on the board. Here's the cation. Here's the anion. So what goes first, the cation or the anion? Why? Because of Mr. and Mrs. If you wonder why envelopes are addressed, Mrs. and Mr., it's because of chemistry. The Mr. is associated with the cation. The Mrs. is associated with the anion. So the cation is going to transfer its electrons to the anion. So this would be an example of an ionic compound. All ionic compounds are composed of cations and anions. And they're all considered to be what? Are, are all ionic compound salts? Kennedy, are all ionic compound salts? No. Yes. All ionic compounds are considered to be salts. Now, if you look up the definition of a salt in a textbook, it will say salts result from acid-base reactions, such as vinegar and baking soda. So under the salt definition, the magnesium oxide is not a salt, under the acid-base definition of a salt. So there is some controversy here happening. Uh, they're going to describe magnesium oxide as being a metal oxide. Why is it being described as a metal oxide? Because when you put this in water, you put MgO in water, the oxygen is going to be attacked. Other anions are going to seek this out. because It's a 2 negative. This O2 negative doesn't exist in the water. O2 exists in the water. How do we know O2 exists in the water? How do we know O2 exists in the water? Fish breathe it. Right, so oxygen, this is the preferred oxygen formation in the water. This is not preferred. So other things are going to seek this out and change it into another polyatomic ion or O2. And because of that, it's not technically considered to be a salt. Now, if you look at Epsom salts, it does have magnesium in it, but it's got like magnesium sulfate. So, would I consider MgO a salt? Yes. And I consider it a salt because it fits the definition of an ionic compound. We talked yesterday about electronegativity and electro electronegativity values designate MgO as a salt. So it's kind of one of those exceptions. The exception is it doesn't fall into the acid-base definition of a salt. That is, you're not going to make rock salt out of MgO. That's the thinking. Everybody clear? That's kind of what's going on. All right, so uh, in the lab, there's some procedures that we're going to follow. The thing I want to bring to your attention the most would be don't touch the crucible. It's going to burn you. It's white, and you think it's not hot, and then you touch it, and it burns you. So when we get over there, make sure you get your goggles on and I'll explain some more things to you there. You're close to it. You are doing the right thing. You're trying to give it what? You said turn it right no. Don't throw them in the sink. You can wet them, but if they get in the sink, they'll stop up the drains. Now you want the cone to be at a tip. I'm adding oxygen to it. See how it's at a tip there? That's how you're going to have a very hot point. You want to go ahead and cover it up. This one is controlling the oxygen flow. Yeah. Okay. that you are familiar with. Have you ever seen a compound with a formula such as Na23 chlorine 3.9? In fact, such a I mean salt 23. I mean sodium 23. In fact, such a formula is impossible. Only whole atoms, not fractions of atoms, react with each other to form products. Also, although elements may react in different portions, proportions to form more than one compound, the proportions of atoms in those compounds will always be a ratio of small whole numbers. An empirical formula gives the simplest whole number ratio of the different atoms in a compound. For example, while the molecular formula for hydrogen peroxide is H2L2, 
simplest whole number ratio of hydrogen and oxygen atoms can be expressed as HL. Thus, the empirical, empirical formula of hydrogen peroxide is HL. In slab, you will, be, you will experimentally determine the empirical formula of magnesium oxide, the compound formed when magnesium metal reacts with oxygen. Crucible. <coughs> How much magnesium goes in the crucible? Shayla? 25 centimeters goes in here. So when you're you're gonna heat it for about five or ten by by five minutes, and then you're gonna take the lid off. It's gonna glow. Then put the leave the lid off for about a minute so it keeps glowing. Then put the lid back on because it'll raise the temperature again. Then take the lid off and let it glow. You want it to go to where it stops glowing. That's when you know the reaction's complete and you have just ash. It's not easy to do. It's not easy to show that the mass is more. Because if the tongs touch the, the magnesium, it'll capture some of the ash and affect your mass. So when we get over there, I'll show you how to properly hold the crucible. Any questions? So we take this off. You want to have your goggles on when you're messing with the fire because you could get sparks come off. So as I take this off, you can see that it's starting to ignite. See the flame happening in there? Yeah. Which is what you want to do. You're feeding it oxygen now. So it's going to start making the actual Can I open my lid up? Yeah. yeah, you can open yours up. Now, you'll put the lid back on once it stops burning in there. See how if it stops burning, put oh, the lid back on. Snap. It's still burning though. Still going? When can I put okay. the lid back on? Now I'll put it back on. Let's get the temperature up just a little bit hotter. Ooh, ooh, look, 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 look. Oh my God! It hurts my blood. Pop! No, this way. Look. That's really good. My car. Thank you. That's kind of what you're looking for. Yeah. See you there. You got that good fire happening in there. See that in there? It's all hot. It's really good. Yeah. What you're gonna do? You hit zero. And you should be able to get your magnesium in there. You need to have your magnesium. No, in we had to measure the combined of the. Right, but you also need the magnesium because you're going to burn it. Okay, that's. Put that down too. Yeah. Isaiah looks really good. Yeah.